Tonight, Cindy Crawford unravels the mystery behind her Midwestern family's origins. So he ditched his kid, and as far as we know, never returned. Her search takes her to England. What's in the scroll? Where she finds a family pulled apart by civil war. If you don't surrender, you'll all be massacred. And then to Germany. We are getting back to something very august. Where Cindy uncovers an unbelievable connection to early European royalty. Are you kidding me? One of the first true supermodels, Cindy Crawford transformed the image of fashion models from mannequins to superstars. Discovered in her small Illinois hometown at the age of 17, Cindy's career quickly soared, making her the highest paid model in the world. She's graced the covers of more than 400 magazines, walked the runways for designers from Chanel to Ralph Lauren, and been at the helm of several successful beauty and design brands. Cindy lives in Malibu with her husband and their two children. I grew up in DeKalb, Illinois, uh, which is about 60 miles straight west of Chicago. And it's not really, people think maybe it's suburban, but it's not. It's small town, Illinois. And it was a great place to grow up. I consider myself just like the kind of Midwestern next door neighbor girl. Kind of made a career on that, so <laughs> I'm sticking with that story. But yeah, that's how I see myself. Just kind of simple life, a house you didn't lock the doors, but surrounded by family and cousins and extended family. I mean, I'm lucky because when I was born, I had all four great-grandmothers living and two great-grandfathers. They lived in Minnesota, and we would go and visit them like two or three times a year. Between Illinois and Minnesota, that's as far back as I've ever gone with my family. I have no idea how they ended up there. I always say I'm just an American mutt because I know all of my grandparents were born here and I'm pretty sure all my great-grandparents were born here. So, you know, I'm just like, we're like, you know, Midwestern potato-eating people. So I guess it would be cool to have some person that was like historically relevant, like that would be kind of cool. But the main thing for me is just like having that sense of connection to history. I'm excited about doing this for for myself and also for my family. I'm especially excited to share it with my kids. You know, I have a daughter who's in sixth grade, her name's Kaya, and I know that she has to do a big family history project. So I figure, okay, this is my daughter's project right here, like, and it'll be really cool. It'll, you know, cause, because my family, we, I mean, being American is great, but we all came from somewhere and I don't, I don't have any of that. I don't have any of those pieces to the puzzle. I'm going to start by looking into my dad's mom because she and I are very close. Her name is Ramona Hemingway. So this is me and Grandma Ramona, and I'm pretty sure this was taken at a Hemingway family reunion, probably in Mankato, Minnesota. And that's a name that I've always been really curious about. Like, are we related to Ernest Hemingway or not? Other than just it being family rumor, I, I don't know. This is Ramona's parents. Hazel Brown Hemingway, my great-grandma, and Frank Hemingway. I knew both of them very well. We would go up there every summer when I was a kid. And Frank was a popcorn farmer, and all he wanted was one son, because all farmers want sons, yet he had eight daughters. Now, this picture is Frank's parents, my great-great-grandparents, Grandpa Lou, and he, they called Grandma Lou, too, but I'm sure they both weren't named Gr Lou, but I never knew him and I don't know anything about him. So I guess that's where I'm going to start my search. And so I am going to search Ancestry.com for Lou, assuming that that's Lewis, a short name for Lewis, L-A-U-I-S, Hemingway, my great-great-grandpa, Minnesota. 
and I'm going to search. Okay, so I have a lot of Lewis Hemingways. So then I'm going to click on Vernon, Blue Earth, Minnesota. So that's right where, near where my great grandparents lived. Let's see what it says. It says 1880. Okay, Lewis Hemingway. He was 13 when the census was taken. He was born in Minnesota. His father's name was Frank. So it looks like I found the correct Lewis Hemingway. It makes sense that he would have named his son after his father. So that Frank Hemingway would be my great, great, great grandfather. His father was from New Hampshire. Wow, I had no idea. As far as I knew, everybody on my dad's side was Minnesota. So the next step would be to look up this other Frank Hemingway in New England and seeing where that leads me. And I don't know if that will be closer or further away from my uh, fantasy of being related to Ernest Hemingway. I've got my first clue about my family's origins before they arrived in the Midwest. My great-great-great-grandfather, Frank Hemingway, was actually born in New Hampshire in the 1800s. So I'm headed to the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston. I want to see how far back I can take my family tree. So I've asked genealogist Chris Child to do some research for me. I thought that this was a good place to start to try to figure out where Frank Hemingway came from. And is there any connection to Ernest Hemingway? Well, I took the research from Frank Hemingway, and I was able to trace the Hemingway family back beyond him. And mm -hmm. I have some good news. You, you do have a distant connection to the writer Ernest Hemingway. That's really cool. Your grandmother, Ramona Hemingway, is an eighth cousin to Ernest Hemingway. That is amazing. And I don't know if she really knows yeah. that. I can't wait to tell her. And then to you, we're going two generations down, so we are once twice removed. So, so eight cousins twice removed. Yes. Awesome. In the course of researching this family, I was actually able to find another one of your ancestors that was even more impressive. Oh, um, really? And okay. that's this Trowbridge family. So you can see here where I'm showing the lines from Frank Hemingway to Ebenezer Hemingway. So this is five times great-grandfather named Ebenezer Hemingway. Okay. And his wife is Ruth Gates. All right. And she's the daughter of Amos Gates and Mary Trowbridge. Okay. And what's the deal with the Trowbridges? It's her who we're following back. Okay. So she's born 1728. And then we go back to her father, John, grandfather, Thomas, great-grandfather, James, and great-great-grandfather, Thomas. Oh, and this goes back to England. Yes. Wow, my 10 times great-grandfather. This is the first relative that I found that wasn't born in the United States. Yes. So Thomas is the one who made the big voyage. That's really cool. So it's actually a very well-known family, and this is one genealogy that we have here in our library. If you Wait, wanna... this whole book is just about Trowbridge? Just Trowbridge. Wow. Coming up, Cindy uncovers a shocking twist in the life of her 10 times great-grandfather. And his family to be dissolved. Wow. And later, she finds an amazing ancestral connection. Are you kidding me? Cindy Crawford is in Boston, Massachusetts, where she just discovered a book that could tell her when and why her 10 times great-grandfather, Thomas Trowbridge, came to the American colonies from England. So this is Thomas Trowbridge. The first of his family to come to America was the son of John Trowbridge, a wealthy merchant and prominent citizen of Taunton, Somersetshire. His father had long been identified with the woolen trade in Taunton, and it was natural that the son, when he grew up, should turn his attention to some branch of that industry. So I see that in 1627, Thomas married a woman named Elizabeth, and while they were still in England, they had four children. The youngest was born in 1633. So from looking at this genealogy book and this chart, and that's where my nine times great-grandfather, James Trowbridge, shows up born in Dorchester, Massachusetts in 1636, right? Yes. So this 
is a child that was born to them after they moved to the New World. Yes. Between 1633 and 1636. That's when they made the move. Yes. So give me like historical background, what's going on, and also like in comparison to the Mayflower and all of that, like where are we in time? Sure. So this is the period known as the Great Migration. Okay. And they're coming primarily for religious reasons. There's a whole lot of social and political people going on. In 1620, the Mayflower set sail from England to the American colonies sparking a 20-year movement of some 20,000 Puritans, including the Trowbridge family, called the Great Migration. Many Puritans were fleeing religious persecution, including imprisonment and torture, sanctioned by King Charles I. Disgusted with their monarch and the Church of England, idealistic reformers like Thomas Trowbridge left England in hopes of finding a fresh start in the colonies. So they were coming mostly for religious freedom and opportunity? Yes, the Puritan ideal is to come here sort of to escape religious persecution, but right. also to establish their idea of what they consider to be a more purer church. So they were in Massachusetts Bay in 1636. This is the only record I was able to find at this point. I looked at a number of records from some of the other colonial New England settlements, and I was able to find this history, the New Haven colony. The New Haven Colony. If you want to read there. Quickly grasping the vision of a kingdom of Christ on the shores of Long Island Sound, a colony settled by kindred souls. In the Bay Colony, pressure of population was beginning to be felt, meaning... The Boston area, Massachusetts just Bay... too populated. It's getting too populated, but also there's dissensions. Uh, there's dif differing, differing opinions about... The, the church. So there was a group that settled in New Haven that said that the church was not strict enough. So this, so this is the group that wanted to be more strict? Yes. Like so more Puritan values or, yeah, okay. Among those who undertook either to advance to the frontier with the original company or to follow soon after were Thomas Jeffrey, Thomas William Preston, hey, there it is, Thomas Trowbridge. Wow. It's so fascinating moving from England to the wilderness, yes. really, to, to set up this ideal r religious community, right? Like a kind of utopia for Puritans? I mean, was that... Yes, all of these indications indica yes. would indicate he was a committed Puritan. But was, would this be like Quaker or...? It's primarily congregational. Con it's funny because my family, the, the church that I grew up going to was congregationalist kept the same religion yeah. all those generations. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, religion has always been a, an important part, especially of like the Hemingway family. I remember staying with my great grandparents and I mean, you for everyone went to church Sunday morning. The church was really central to how they define themselves as a family. Seems like in some ways that those Trowbridge Puritan values really trickled down all the way to my great grandparents. That's pretty incredible to go back that far on my, my first day really uh, doing this, but um, where do I go next? The Connecticut State Library is a great place uh, to do research on the New Haven Colony. They have a lot of original records. Okay, great. That will be my next step then. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I knew my family were not Native American, so I knew we got over here somehow, but I never really looked that far back. I think this sets the bar really high for a first day. I've already gone back to 1633 to find out when my family came from England here. So I'm excited to see where this journey takes me. So now I'm heading to Hartford, Connecticut. I'm curious to know what happened to the Trowbridge family once they moved to the New Haven colony sometime after 1636. So I've asked historian Judy Schiff to pull any records she could find on the family. Well, I've had a chance to do some research in the records here, and there is a trail of uh, information about Thomas Trowbridge in the New Haven colony. So what is this? This is a court document that has a specific date on it, so we can follow the progress of the Trowbridge family in New Haven. November 3rd of 1641 says, it is ordered that an attachment be sent forth to distrain the goods of Mr. Trowbridge to pay 
the town's rates, which should be taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And to fulfill the demands of those persons to whom he is indebted. So what does it mean? He, he owed people money? So it shows, first of all, that um, he hasn't been paying his taxes or certain bills. They're, they're actually going to go into his uh, estate and, and uh, make these payments happen. There's some, some problem here because he's not paying his bills. That's right. We can move further along to another case that was held in April of 1644. Trowbridge, right here. Very good. Okay. For as much as the whole estate of Thomas Trowbridge of New Haven is to be sequestered for the payment of his debts, he absenting himself and taking no course concerning the same, and his family to be dissolved. Wow. Coming up. Cindy researches the mysterious disappearance of her ten times great-grandfather. And as far as we know, there's no records of him ever coming back. No. Cindy Crawford is at the Connecticut State Library, where she has just learned that by 1644, her ten times great-grandfather, Thomas Trowbridge, disappeared from his family in the New Haven colony. Sergeant Jeffrey and his wife, being willing to take the children of the said Thomas Trowbridge, provided that in case their father shall come over, come over, ooh, that's kind of a clue, right? Mm -hmm. That then he will refer himself to the court to judge and determine what is equal for him to have for the keeping of them. So the court took it upon themselves to place the children with, like, a foster family. Exactly. But what about his wife? Mysteriously, there's no record of Mrs. Trowbridge. Wow. So uh, he lost she, his has, wife. she wow. has already vanished from the record. Wow. So probably his wife died, even yes. though we don't have a record of that. Possibly, yeah. And as far as you found in the New Haven documents, he never returned? No. We felt that it was pretty early on, probably, that Thomas Trowbridge leaves New Haven. Okay. And uh, sure enough, we found a very interesting document. In this area, you'll see Thomas Trowbridge. Yeah, I see Trowbridge right here. Right. And this is weddings. That's right. Thomas Trowbridge married Frances Shattuck. So this oh. wedding actually took place in 1641. But where? In the same area that he came from. So he went, he left his children in New Haven and went back to Taunton to find a wife. Would it have been that difficult to find a wife in New Haven? Yes, because each of these households had come over together. And uh, presumably, any of the single women, very often they were elderly, a grandmother or great-grandmother, or a servant of a certain category that would not maybe be suitable. So he went back to England, ditched his kids, and as far as we know, there's no records of him ever coming back. No. But there is records of the Trowbridge family staying in New Haven. So it seems that the children stayed. As far as we know, I think to find out more, you're going to have to go to some sources in England. Okay, that'll be my next stop then. <laughs> when I first started looking at the documents today, and most of the time Thomas Trowbridge's name appeared, it was because he owed money. So at first I'm thinking like deadbeat dad or something like that. That didn't make me go, I really want to get to know this guy maybe there's something else going on. There m must be a reason, good or bad, we don't know yet, but it doesn't really fit his pattern. He came to New Haven and he moved his whole family there, so it d that doesn't seem like a thing that someone would do if their intention was just to abandon them there. I'm sure losing his wife could have, you know, some people go crazy when something like that happens. I don't know. All I know is that he did go back to England and that's what I want to figure out what happened from there? 
So now I'm off to Taunton, England, Thomas Trowbridge's hometown. I'm meeting historian Susan Hardman Moore at the Somerset Heritage Center. She's been looking into why my ancestor never returned to his family in New Haven. I found out that my 10 times great-grandfather, Thomas Trowbridge, mm -hmm. moved to the New Haven colony, but it looks like his wife died and he came back to England to get a new wife. But it doesn't look like he ever went back to New Haven. Um, thinking generally about the period, it wasn't that unusual for people to come back from New England, either temporarily or for good. Okay. There was a lot of tension in England at that time with King Charles I. He ruled for 11 years without a parliament, but in 1640 he had to call parliament because he needed money. He was at war with the Scots. And so news that Charles had called a parliament would have come over to New England, uh, take several months to get there, of course, but we do see in 1640-41, just at the time when Thomas Trowbridge comes back, a great sort of surge of people coming home because all kinds of new possibilities seem to be opening up. Okay, so what do you have? To, what have you found? <laughs> so let me show you what I've found. Oh, this is a white glove. <laughs> a white it's glove. a white glove activity. Okay. Yes, you need to put these Thank on. You. Yeah. Wow, isn't it amazing that the ink and the paper still stays. Wow. Just to explain what this document is, okay. it's from the Taunton Quarter Session Rolls. That's what the technical name for it. The Quarter okay. Session is a local court. One of its roles was to award pensions to people who had been wounded in war. This document comes from October 1652. Taunton. Does that say Taunton Borough? Taunton Borough, yeah. Wow, I, can't, I can only read about every third word. Oh, Trowbridge right there. So, I've not got a transcript here. here. Okay. If that would help? Yes. Let me see. And then Take a look I at can, that okay. too. These are to certify all whom it may concern that Richard Hillard of Taunton, okay. during the several sieges thereof, was a faithful soldier under the command of Captain Thomas Trowbridge. Okay, that's new information. In the regiment of Colonel Robert Blake. Wow, so he was a captain in what would he, in what? What would that <laughs> okay. consider? Well, it says in the document that he served under the command of Colonel Robert Blake. Right. And that places him in the parliamentary army. In the parliamentary army. Because this is written during the time of Oliver Cromwell when England was at war. And Taunton became a real center of resistance. Uh, to the king. We're talking about the English Civil War here. Wow, 1644 came back to fight. Coming up, Cindy confronts the dramatic history that pulled her ancestors' family apart. Surrender now and I'll spare your lives, but if you don't surrender, you'll all be massacred. Wow. Cindy Crawford is in Taunton, England, where she's just discovered that her ancestor, Thomas Trowbridge, was a captain in the Parliamentary Army during the English Civil War. So once he got back here, found the wife, he ended up staying. Well, that's right. I mean, when he first came back, the Civil War hadn't broken out. He got remarried in 1641. In 1642, the Civil War breaks out. In 1642, years of conflict in England erupted into civil war. Instead of fleeing from King Charles's religious oppression, as he had done back in the 1630s, this time, Thomas Trowbridge chose to stay in England and fight. Trowbridge joined the Parliamentary Army, of which Oliver Cromwell was a leader, hoping to defeat the King's royalist forces and finally put an end to what Trowbridge saw as the rule of a brutal tyrant. Taunton was a real hot spot in the English Civil War and mm. so it was a real center of resistance to the King's forces and Trowbridge would have been one of the key people in the castle right. defending the castle and the town and holding it for Parliament. So this petition says, showeth that your petitioner during the several sieges, sieges of Taunton was a faithful soldier under the command 
of Captain Thomas Trowbridge. So this guy also was wounded in battle under Captain Thomas Trowbridge, mm -hmm. and he's petitioning also for a pension. Wow. It seems like Thomas really looked out for the guys that fought under him. Right. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. wow. And this is signed, Thomas Trowbridge Captain. Mm -hmm. And that would be his, That's his signature. actual signature. Yeah. Wow. It still seems a little bit strange to me that you could just leave your children in like the new world yes. and come back. I, I admit it does seem strange to us now, but it wasn't actually that unusual for families to be divided by the Atlantic. Maybe Thomas Trowbridge intended to come back temporarily, maybe send for the children to come over, but shipping was disrupted, the sending of letters was disrupted during the Civil War. Okay, so I won't, I'll, uh, I'll give him a break. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so knowing that he stayed in England, what did Thomas do during the siege of Taunton? Well, I think it would be lovely for you to visit Taunton Castle and meet my fellow historian, Bernard Capp, who would be able to tell you all about the history of the battle that took place. So if you wanted to, you could go and take a look and actually see where Thomas Trowbridge fought. Absolutely, that sounds amazing. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Usually when I travel, I do try to take in some cultural experience. And here, I get to do that, but add in with um, a direct connection to me. To think that my 10 times great-grandfather was here in Taunton fighting during the English Civil War. It just humanizes history. I'm headed to Taunton Castle to find out more about Thomas Trowbridge's experience during the siege of Taunton. Historian Bernard Cap is here to fill me in on all the action. How are you? Hi, Cindy. Very good to meet you. Yesterday, I found out that Thomas Trowbridge was a captain in the English Civil War. So I, I guess I'm curious, I, how does a siege work? Set the stage for me a little bit. What okay. was happening in Taunton at, in 1641 or 42? So when Blake uh, came in and got Trowbridge and these others involved, the, the first task was to dig trenches, put up barricades, all sorts of things. So the, the, the castle was the, the ultimate stronghold and defense bastion. Bernard tells me that in October of 1644, Taunton was the only parliamentarian holdout in Somerset County, so it was targeted by King Charles. His royalist forces surrounded the town and left the citizens with no access to help or supplies. What's even more extraordinary to me was Thomas's role in the siege. As captain, he was responsible for protecting the people of Taunton during the brutal attack that lasted seven months. To begin with, the, the garrison only had supplies of food or uh, ammunition, gunpowder and so on, for three months. So there's a real stress there. How are they going to last out? Yeah. In, in the last two or three months of the siege, it was tighter than ever before, which meant no food getting in. And there was desperate hunger. They were down to their very last supplies, almost out of food. They had to take thatch from the roofs of the houses to feed the horses. Um, and they were down to the last two barrels or so of gunpowder. So they, they were very close, I guess, to having to, to give up in time. Wow. The Royalists did break through these barricades, so they got through most of the town. They burnt a lot of the houses. And the commander sent this final challenge or summons to Blake saying, surrender now and I'll spare your lives. But if you don't surrender, you'll all be massacred. Wow. Cindy Crawford is at Taunton Castle in England, where in 1645, her ancestor, Thomas Trowbridge, was issued an ultimatum to surrender the castle or be killed by King Charles's army. The siege was maintained over quite a long period, and the town is literally desolate and destroyed, and they're half starved. But they held out, and in the nick of time, the royalists have to withdraw to go and face Cromwell. So the siege is lifted, and the garrison, the people survive. They managed to hold on. Yeah. But a great cost to the community, correct? It, it's a huge cost, yes. And we have an account from the force coming into the town. This is an extract from it. On the 12th, Colonel Weldon entered the town, the inhabitants being joyed beyond expression. I bet they were yes. thrilled. <laughs> 
The country people, to the number of about a thousand, came in from their hiding places in the woods and with broad eyes of wonder gazed upon the works which had defended the place and upon the soldiers who had defended the works, looking upon them as giants rather than men. So Thomas Trowbridge would have been considered a giant by the country people who came in because he was one of the soldiers yes, that yes. defended them. He's one of the leading giants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me, it seems like Taunton was a very decisive victory um, in the English Civil War. Well, Taunton was just one action, one siege. The, the war still goes on. There are big battles to be fought. But it's, Parliament is now on the upper hand. And a year later, in 1646, Parliament does finally come out on top. The war ends. The king has to surrender. What happens next? Trowbridge stays in Taunton. Something like two-thirds of the houses we've just seen had been destroyed by fire or battered, and they would have to face the prospect of starting life all over again. One of the things that really made me feel proud yesterday was that after the war, he petitioned the court on behalf of the soldiers who were injured under his service in the war to help them get pensions, to help yes. care for their family. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, he was an officer who cared about the men who'd been working with him, fighting for him. It just goes back to, like, that is innate in all of us, that we, we, help, we want to help people. Great. Thank That'd you nice. so much. It's been a pleasure. I think being here at Taunton Castle today helped me imagine what life was like for Thomas Trowbridge. Things were hot and heavy here. It was not easy and that he would have been in the thick of it. Thomas had already left his homeland to escape the oppression of King Charles, but when he had the opportunity to fight for his beliefs, he took it. It's an honor to be descended from such a brave and committed man. I'm definitely interested in looking even further back into the Trowbridge family history, if that exists. I mean, we're already very far back, so I don't know if there's records beyond that, but that would be fascinating to me. It's incredible to follow my ancestry back to early 1600s England. But I want to see if I can go even further back, so I'm heading to London. I've been in London a lot over the last, I don't know, since I started modeling, but never really come and thought about my connection to England. It makes me more curious in a way, and looking at every building and every landmark and thinking, how am I connected to that? I'm meeting with genealogist Charles Mosley, who's been working on tracing my family beyond Thomas Trowbridge. What did you bring for me? What I'm excited to see. What's, what's in this scroll? Quite a bit. Uh, let's try rolling it back okay. and see where it takes us. But overall, over, shall we say, the next 10 generations, your ancestors are stepping up in the world, as you'll discover, by just tracing their steps. We have here Thomas Trowbridge, the mm -hmm. one that we've mentioned, son of John Trowbridge. But John Trowbridge marries a member of the Prowse family, the gentry, definite gentry status people, and one of them, William de Moon himself, the second, in the first half of the 12th century, is created Earl of Somerset. This is unbelievable. Charles has been able to trace my family tree back more than 12 centuries. It takes me from England to continental Europe, where I have distinguished ancestors that include counts, dukes, and even a king of Italy. Not bad for a girl from the Midwest. So from Thomas Trowbridge, 10 times great-grandfather, all the way up here to 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39, 40. And then 40. we are getting back to something very august. <gasps> are you kidding me? Who Do You Think You Are is brought to you in part by Ancestry.com. Cindy Crawford is in London, where she is about to discover an unbelievable ancestral connection. Charlemagne, are you kidding me? No, no, not so the least. Would I, would I dare? You are descended from European royalty, and quite a bit of royalty. That's amazing. 
And Charlemagne at the top. Charlemagne Incredible. at the top, as he deserves to be. Wow. This says Charlemagne was born on the 2nd of April in 748, Aachen, Germany. It's a long time ago. Wow. She is the first person since the Roman Empire to unify Europe. And that is why his name has such resonance today as the father of Europe. Hmm. And indeed, he is the father of you, many times back, of course, great, 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 great times. I never would have imagined anything about, you know, I'm, I'm from like Midwestern, um, you know, farm people. So this is just incredible. Thank you There's so much. There's royal blood in the West, in the Midwest. <laughs> it's certainly something to put in your dining room wall. I have to have very long, Well, you're going to have to raise the ceiling, but I, that, that, that's not a problem, is it? Off to Germany. Okay, and I look forward you. to seeing you. Bye. I already thought going back to Thomas Trowbridge in the 1600s was, you know, that was pretty impressive and pretty far back. And then we jumped almost a thousand years to Charlemagne. It, it, it's way bigger and um, further back than I even would have dreamed. I really want to learn everything about Charlemagne. I was a good student, but, you know, some of that stuff you learn for the test and you forget. I mean, you listen differently when it's related to you, when you have like a personal connection to it. So just to give the whole uh, the historical context and, and, and just to learn a little bit about the man. I'm heading now to Aachen, Germany, where Charlemagne lived. about Charlemagne's life and legacy, I'm meeting with Professor Rosamund McKitterick at Aachen Cathedral. Charlemagne's father took over when he was about three years old as king. So this little boy of three was then brought up as a prince. As a prince, a king of what though? What king of Francia, and it was what we would think of as France, okay. roughly speaking. So Charlemagne then inherited from his father, and what he decided to do, he started to expand the kingdom. So he went across the Alps, he conquered the Lombard kingdom and became king of the Lombards. He had expeditions to the Spain, he conquered right down to the Pyrenees and even a bit beyond. So by the time you get to around 800, Charlemagne is now ruler of most of what we would call Western Europe. Wow. And what can you tell me about Charlemagne as, you know, the, the person? One of the famous poems by Alcuin, who was an Englishman from York at the court, describes all the girls, the daughters around the throne. Charlemagne was so fond of them, he wouldn't let them get married. His daughters. His daughters. But we do know that the girls were also as well educated as the sons. And he had 20 children altogether. From, from different women, I'm assuming. Different women. But there were... 20 children in 20 all. children altogether. And in fact, we do know of one person who wrote about him in great detail, which was a man called Einhard. And Einhard was actually at Charlemagne's court. And after he died, he wrote a biography of him. But have a look at this, because that's a description of what your super granddaddy looked like. Charles was large and strong. Charles, is that what they would have called him? Carolus Charles, yes. Huh. His height is well known to have been seven times the length of his foot. Well, that's a funny... Um, well, he was probably a very tall man. Okay. Yeah. The upper part of his head was round, his eyes very large and animated, nose a little long, hair fair, and face laughing and merry. Thus, his appearance was always stately and dignified. His gait was firm, his whole carriage manly and his voice clear, but not so strong as his size led one to expect. His health was excellent, except during the four years preceding his death when he was subject to frequent fevers. Even in those years, he consulted rather his own inclinations than the advice of physicians, who were almost hateful to him because they wanted him to give up roast, <laughs> to which he was accustomed, and to eat boiled meat instead. So they already knew that then, that that was <laughs> healthier. You know what's amazing about this is how, is how personal it is. Yeah. How, yeah. like, you feel like y you're getting to know the man, not h this historical figure. Yes. And what did the, like, what did people think about him? You know, were people happy to be kind of united under Charlemagne? That's the part that makes him so different. He's not just a conqueror. Mm -hmm. He's not just somebody who bullies people or rules them even effectively, which is all, if you're ruling by justice, that's good. But he's also promoting culture and learning really fantastically. 
And a wonderful way that we know that peace is being retained throughout this vast area is we know about a lot of the palaces, but they weren't fortified. So it must have been wow. peaceful. We, huh. You haven't got great big fortresses set up everywhere. You have beautiful palaces. People come to them, assemblies are held. You can travel throughout the kingdom. So there's a great deal of effort to try and rule things, to control things, to make sure that the king is in touch. I mean, this space is so magnificent and beautiful. What is the relevance of being here for Charlemagne? This is his palace chapel. It's the place he wanted to express his commitment and achievement and his aims as a Christian ruler. Wow. It dates probably from around 796 with the marble, the arches, the glorious mosaics. You have to imagine that this is somewhere he was coming every day. He would come to mass. And for the last part of his life, he lived here more or less all the time. I feel like you know, I have a more understanding about his legacy in terms of you know, the world, but instead of it just being a name, Charlemagne, that I have a connection to, I feel now that there's a connection to a person who was Charlemagne. So thank you very much. It's been much. a great pleasure, Cindy. Thank you. I'm still digesting the fact that, you know, yes, grew up small, Midwestern girl. The connection to Charlemagne it is very humbling. My 41 times great-grandfather was living in the 700s. And the world was very different then, but in some ways it makes you realize Time is elastic. It can seem very long ago, but then it doesn't seem that long ago. I can't wait to share this experience with my children and my husband and the greater part of my family, because I think everyone will be so interested, not only for them to kind of feel that they are a tiny little blip of this part of history, but also just for them to learn. If you would have said, like, to try to connect myself to someone in history, I think the farthest back I would have even thought was, like, 1600s, where, where we had Thomas Trowbridge. I, I wouldn't have even imagined that you could go farther than that. And we went almost another thousand years beyond that. Thomas Trowbridge, Charlemagne, they're real people. So learning about that history, to me, that's a link. That's a real, tangible link. I feel so fortunate to have participated in this experience because I think it's bigger than certainly I would have imagined. It's been amazing. <laughs>